I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 86, Managing Competition. Managing Competition. This vlog suggestion comes again from one of our wonderful students at Flinders University, Ellen. Hi Ellen. Ellen is a PhD student in the first year of her program and she sent me a very moving email that asked me to help her and all of you think through the nature of competition. That notion that on a daily basis people are trying to undermine you to make themselves feel better. Wow, really powerful email and I've been thinking through that vlog suggestion for about six weeks trying to find some good research to think through and help you handle this really pretty complicated and emotionally volatile issue. And Ellen, I understand this worry perhaps more than you know. The happiest times of my life, if I'm really honest, are about 2am to 4.30am in the morning where it's quiet, I'm on my own and I'm reading and I'm writing and I'm doing research. There's no one there with bitchy comments, no oversharing, no weird emails, no supposed academics who read very little and think even less. So it's just me competing with the absolute edge of knowledge. And I find that very inspiring. I find that very empowering. It's actually my favorite bit of uh, the job as an academic. And I am a radically interdisciplinary scholar. So my imperative is to move at speed between different disciplines, between different tropes, between different theories. So I always think what I do in my academic life feels a lot like Peter Capaldi. In the, as Doctor Who in that episode of Hellbent, where he was banging against this wall for millennia, just year after year after year banging against the wall. And that's what it should feel like. You are working against knowledge. You are trying to transform. You've got momentum to try and make knowledge excellent, transformative, big, powerful. You are competing with the greatest minds that have ever lived. You're not competing with some random guy in Adelaide or a bloke at a conference that you go to. You've got to have slightly bigger expectations. So I need you to lift for me. I need you to be a scholar of the world and become your best self. And it is really interesting, Ellen, when I was doing the research for you for this vlog, and I put into Google, as you do, Dr. Google Respect, I put into Google, competition between PhD students. And the returns from that search were really, really interesting. Not remotely what I would expect. The first eight pages of returns, not the first eight returns, the first eight pages of returns came from institutions, came from university formal websites, particularly in North America, particularly the United States. And what these universities were doing, what they were selling, was the competitive nature of their PhD programs. So nothing about individual students or individual researchers or how competition may help or hinder a PhD student. No, none of that was relevant. Instead, the universities were using the notion of competition to sell their programs. Now that's absolutely fine and great if you're dealing with corporate branding, not a worry, that's cool. But it's really not helping you a great deal as an individual student. So Ellen, you've picked up a really interesting gap or absence in the literature that we're going to try and fill and work through today. As I always say, success is not a finite resource. Every single one of us can be successful. The interesting thing happens though when I enter Dr. Google once more and I add competition between PhD students and loss of confidence in PhD students. And when you put those two phrases together, the results are, can I say, quite startling. So Ellen, you have picked up something really important here, but I am gonna separate these issues out. This week, I'm going to talk about competition between PhD students, and next week, I'm going to talk about confidence in PhD students, because it's too big to do in one vlog. And I have something really to say about competition that may be of use to you guys today. Before I get into the crunchy bit of the vlog, I just want to put in a caveat, if I can. I do want you all to think about the role of social justice in all of this. 
I'm getting quite concerned about the use of social justice at the moment. It's becoming a bit ticker box. Oh yes, social justice. And lots of people nod around a table. And social justice is actually a hell of a lot more than nodding around the table going, yes, oh, respect, boom, yep, cool. If you're committed to social justice, then you've really got to ask yourself, why am I competing? Why am I pushing somebody else down so that I can feel better? If you want social justice, if you really do, if it's something you really believe in, then you have to live that minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Competition is the antithesis of social justice. So when we start this conversation today and leading into next week, I want you to be really clear what is important to you. And you might want to pause the vlog at this point and go, well, what does matter to me? How do I feel about competition? How do I feel about my relationship with other people? So think through that work a little bit and then now let's crunch into the vlog proper. You see, I think competition and confidence gets really messed up and confused in academic life. But competition, I think, too often takes the form of taking other people's confidence away from them. And it shouldn't be like that. So the look at me, look at me, look at me, that stuff's bad enough. And it really is bad enough. It's like, I don't really care. Knock yourself out. Boom. Good luck. But then I think the problem goes from the look at me stuff to I'm better than you, I'm better than you, I'm better than you. And the weird thing is, and you might find this too, team, I found as my career has progressed, and I have probably become more successful in that career, the more successful I've become, the more people get in my face and tell me how terrific they are. It is the weirdest thing. And, you know, Great. And my response is always, yeah, wish them well and try and move away from them as quickly as possible. And I cannot tell you how many Australian academics, and can I say it is pretty bad here and I don't know why, but how many Australian academics introduce themselves to me, so hi, how's it going, cool, and within five seconds, five seconds, they're doing like a catalogue of their career greatest hits to tell me how truly fantastic they are. Now, there's a truth of life. Never assume that anyone is actually terribly interested in you, because trust me, they're not. It is also another truth of my academic life, and some of you may already know this, and you may know it to be true through your career, that the best scholars, and I mean the people who have actually changed knowledge, the people who have actually changed knowledge, they never shout, ever. They never say how truly great they are because they don't have to. The work speaks for itself. So don't get dragged into other people's narratives about how great they are. Get away from these people because they're boring, they're delusional, and let's be frank, they're chipping away at who you are. I always say every single one of us, we have to live the future that we want to create. And I want that future for you guys to be brilliant, to be scholarly, to be international, to be imaginative, but also compassionate. Right. So Ellen, I've presented my perspective there on competition. It may be of use to you, but I did want to challenge you a little bit in this vlog too. And so it has a second part, this vlog, where I'm going to get a little bit in your face and get you to think through how and when you may want to click on competition. Because there are moments in your life where you're going to have to bring it. You're going to have to bring it, you're going to have to flick the beast mode, and you're going to have to compete. You're going to have to lift, you're going to have to get into a scrag fight, and you're going to have to win. And these moments almost always invariably involve jobs. Now, when you're applying for a job or when you're trying to get a job, it's going to be competitive. It's going to be nasty, it's going to be aggressive, and you're going to have to summon the beast, and you're going to have to win. Now, I've done this overtly and clearly a few times in my life. I'm not a player, I don't do that sort of stuff, but I have been played once, hard, and the great news is I learned from it, and I'm gonna share that moment when I was played with you in this vlog today, so you can learn from it, so you don't have to go through it. 
So I've applied for a lot of jobs in my career, got a lot as well, and that's terrific. But in the UK, particularly professorial or chair roles are very, very competitive. One of the jobs I got had 800 of the best scholars on this planet applying for that singular job. Everybody wanted that job. It was a great job, great city, fantastic university, and 800 people applied for it, right? And I got it. But before we get to that and that success and how I got there, let me tell you about how sometimes you're going to have to be a beast. Now, before I applied for that really successful job that I got, I applied for another professorial role in England. And I was a pretty competitive candidate. On paper, I was probably the best candidate. After the seminar, I was probably the best candidate. But the university, bless, had one of those crazy new processes that we're seeing all the time now, where they gather all the candidates together and move them around the process like they're a Greek chorus. And the university had shortlisted eight people, eight candidates. And so the eight people were sort of moved around this process throughout the day. So I worked out at eight o'clock, and we all met in the morning, that oh, like, this is gonna be a bit uncomfortable, but you just be nice to people. We're all in a weird situation. Be respectful, be kind, and together sort of get through it. Well, seven of the candidates got on incredibly well and were decent to each other, but there was one random bull in a china shop. He was a 68-year-old man who applied for this post, and he started to talk trash to everybody else who had applied. He was pretending, it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. He was pretending that he was already a member of staff. He constructed this really uncomfortable, false intimacy with the selection panel and was incredibly nasty to other candidates throughout the day. Now, you need to hang on to yourself because my lasting memory, you see my eyes are tearing up in memory of it, it still sort of leaves me my lasting, last, lasting memory of that particular interview day was during the lunch break, right? So the candidates were left in this large interview room during lunch while the panel left to do their first series of discussions after the morning's interview activities. Wow. So panel had gone, here are the eight candidates. And this bloke decided to sit at the interview table he sat at the chair of that table and proceeded to go through the candidates' applications and asked all candidates questions about their applications and even asked me questions about my CV. So, I mean, and I never quite got over that. It was such a, it was like watching a train wreck. It was like, how is this even happening? And I was stunned, a bit horrified, and of course, I'd been played, right? So he talked trash all day about how great he was, pushed everybody else down, and I think you all know where this story is going to end. Yes, he got the job. <laughs> but it's not quite the end of the story because I met the Vice Chancellor of that university six months later at Goldsmiths in London. We were doing a gig there. And uh, I was in a different job at that point, so it was six months later. And he came over and sat next to me. We had a lovely conversation. He's gone on to be a very good mate of mine. But he apologised to me and he stated that the panel had made a mistake, that the guy that they hired had been simply out of control since he arrived and he was simply promoting himself rather than doing the actual work that is, was required of that senior leadership role. And I said, look, no worries at all, life happens, it's cool, I'm sure it'll all settle down. But then I did tell him about the weird behaviour that happened during the lunchtime. And I remember he simply put his head in his hands and replied that the panel just simply got swayed by the swagger, swayed by the confidence but there's actually no delivery. But the thing is this, I learnt from that interview. I learnt a lot from that interview and I still learn from that interview and I hope you learn something too. When I went to my next interview, which was pretty soon after actually, I had learnt from what had happened and this was the big internationally competitive one. So take no prisoners time. Now I was shortlisted, which was a miracle in and of itself. I was the youngest, I was the only woman and I was an Australian. 
And remember, when English people hear our accent, they always place it through a Google stupidity filter. So I had a lot, I had a lot, I wish I was joking. So I had a lot working against me, really. But I'd learnt from that bloke's behaviour at the earlier interview. So I arrived at the venue at 8.45 and I went up to the coffee shop to get myself a bottle of water to put in my handbag. And I saw what was to be one of the three other candidates having a cup of coffee. And can I say, really nice guy, I know him very well, really good scholar too, I like him. And so I did know him, and so I walked over to him, I worked out, he must have been short, listened for the same gig as me, and I said, hi mate, great to see you, shook his hand, wished him well for the day, got the water and left. But out of the corner of my eye, I could see that he lost about a foot in 10 seconds because he realised, and it might not have been an accurate realisation, can I say, he realised that I was probably going to beat him. So before the day had even started, he'd lost confidence, which is a shame because he's a great scholar. Can I say within three months, he got another job as a chair anyway, so he's a great guy. But then I walked to the main holding room or holding area where the other candidate was sitting. Now, <coughs> excuse me, he was an enormous bloke, right? He was built like a brick privy. Armani suit, red tie, bald head. This guy was so big, he blocked out the sun, right? Okay, and I'm five foot two, thanks for playing. This is going well. And then this big guy, started to do the game talk, right? To push me down, to make me lose confidence. But of course, I'd seen what had happened before and I learned from it. So I could see, oh wow, it's happening again. Do not allow the same process to occur. So within a couple of minutes, I pushed back and I pushed back really, really hard. So some of my edited highlights of this two minutes of pushback include, quote, Oh, I see you've just published your second book. That's great. I've just published my 12th book. I'm sure you saw it reviewed in the Times Higher. And of course, my other personal favourite. Oh yes, I actually met the Pro Vice Chancellor of this university yesterday. He's read my work. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it great when a leader of a university is also a scholar? There's just a couple, there were quite a few. Now, everything I said was true, I did not lie, so there was no lies involved, there was no nonsense involved, but I pushed back, and I pushed back hard. So when you make a decision to push back and unleash the beast, then you've got to do it, and you've got to do it hard, and then you've got to stop. Now, after that two minutes, needless to say, our brick privy gentleman was pretty quiet pretty quiet. So then the next issue is what happened next, okay? So I was the first interview at 9 a.m. in the morning. I was the first of the day. Because I desperately wanted this job, I'd done incredible preparation, I knew everything, and I really did bring it. So I did a great interview, best of my life, and it was doing, I was going incredibly well. So the Vice Chancellor of this university later told me that when I left the interview room at 9.50, he turned to his colleagues around the panel, and can I say it was an enormous panel, he turned to his colleagues at the panel and said, it's 9.50, we have our professor, what are we going to do with the rest of the day? Fantastic. But of course, the rest of the day continued. So the big guy walked in at 10. Now, of course, he arrived angry, <laughs> aggressive, and started to be aggressive with the panel because he thought he'd been lined up to fail. Now, that's not the case at all. He was a great scholar, is a great scholar, and was shortlisted on his merits. But he got all a little bit confused with the game playing. And he actually asked the vice chancellor in the interview, quote, why am I here? Why have I bothered to come here today? End of quote. To which the Pro Vice Chancellor replied, you tell us. So he lost that job in the first five minutes of the interview. And the other guy left it all in his tracksuit because he thought I would beat him before the day even started. So Ellen, as you can see, I am really anti-competition. Scholarship comes from hard work, from brilliance, from excellence, from imagination. That's what great scholarship is. But sometimes you've got to get in there and you've got to fight. Now, if I'd sat back on that day, 
one or both of those blokes may have beaten me. I'll, I've, I'll never know if I hadn't talked the talk whether or not that guy would have beaten me. He would have had certainly a good chance to do so. I probably still would have won it, but I'll never know. But every now and again, you're going to have to compete in that way, Ellen, because the problem we've got is a big, posh bloke, English bloke, in a suit, knows how to win knows how to succeed, knows how to compete. That's almost a natural socialisation for them. For those of us that are not white blokes in a suit, we have to learn what success means. We have to learn what it means to compete. We have to learn that. So as I always say, and I hope it's of use to you, competition is a tap. Competition is a tap. Turn it on when you need it. But most of the time, if you turn on competition and no one else is there, you're going to drown yourself because no one else cares. So always remember, assess the situation, turn on the tap if you need it, but remember, yeah, turn it off when you're finished. As always, Ellen, thank you for the, the suggestion. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.